Sholem Aleichem, Assalamu Alaikum, Shalom Aleichem. This is Release Day Part 4. If you are just tuning into this, I strongly suggest that you go back and watch Parts 1, 2, and 3. And now we return to Abraham Weisfile, PhD, live streaming on Facebook. This live streaming was done on April the 8th of 2019. He's ordered me to uh, take the uh, live feed away. He sort of began to approach me, so I'm leaving there. I'm going to pull back here. Okay, he's ordering, uh, he ordered me to away. And he was ordering everybody to, with, to withdraw, to pull back. He doesn't want people to be so close to the prison. These are two Ethiopian Jewish soldiers. Now he's uh, insisting and he's... Uh, but they are withdrawing. They're not using violence. These are Ethiopian prison police who just ordered us back. <sighs> so there, nearly got arrested again. But uh, the two uh, prison guards are withdrawing now. Here they go, far away. Okay. So that's what it's like here. You know, a population under occupation that uh, is obliged to submit to uh, orders at any time by anybody. Uh, okay. Now, in the Israel election coming up, the story is this. So Netanyahu has uh, proposed the uh, annexation of the settlements and the outposts of the settlements. And uh, supposedly this is to gain more votes. But uh, it may backfire on him because uh, if he pulls votes away from some of the more right-wing parties, they will not be able to get uh, representation in the uh, Knesset parliament uh, because they will not pass the 5% um, vote uh, minimum in order to get uh, seats in the Knesset, which would be an interesting and good phenomenon. But uh, the votes may not uh, necessarily go to uh, his party, the Likud, because he is being accused of corruption, three counts of corruption by the Attorney General. And so this has demoralized the supporters, and they don't want to take make the effort to go out and vote for somebody who's, you know, like a jerk, who's just trying to enrich himself and become a member of the national bourgeoisie by way of a political path. Now, the accusations, you know, leveled against him of corruption are this. At one point, in order to get elected in the last election, he made a deal with one newspaper publisher to get a more favorable coverage by um, uh, by withdrawing certain privileges for a second competing Israel newspaper uh, that was financed by uh, Adelson, an American uh, billionaire who finances the settlements, who financed this newspaper that was supporting Netanyahu, and yet Netanyahu uh, stopped that newspaper from being uh, I think it was distributed for free on weekends or on a Sabbath or something like that. Anyway, in order for that um, uh, uh, withdrawal of privilege, the other uh, paper, which is called um, another very old man coming back from work, the other newspaper gave uh, Netanyahu more favorable coverage while, you know, Adelson's newspaper was also giving him favorable coverage. So he was getting it, you know, from both sides. Except that this became known. There was even recording of a telephone conversation to that effect. And this is considered to be political corruption. 
then there's you know the um, monetary corruption in which he was uh, he collected some money uh, kickbacks for giving a contract to uh, some company or other military contractor which bought some submarines u-boats from Germany yes Germany which supplied Israel with uh, submarines to be used as the pa against the Palestinians no not against Palestinians but to function as uh, what the state of Israel has been set up to be as the guard dog of the Middle East on behalf of the um, you know uh, Western uh, Christian Occidental countries so as to uh, protect access to the Suez Canal to um, perhaps uh, get into the Persian Gulf to threaten Iran with submarines that may very well have uh, nuclear capable missiles on it and yes of course Israel has nuclear bombs you know about 200 or so supposedly and so on it goes and then the third accusation of corruption against Netanyahu was I forget there's just too much okay now the opposition to Netanyahu has been gaining traction one is this a former general who boasts about how many people he killed in Gaza I think the number is 1355 or something that he put into a publicity and actually rolled the numbers before everybody to impress everyone and this general who uh, is, is called by the right wing a um, a secret liberal or leftist uh, Gantz is his name and he's in uh, formed an alliance with a uh, Lapid uh, which is a former television uh, personality who formed a centrist party which was calling for secularism and he wanted to um, force the recruitment of the um, Jewish uh, Orthodox youth into the military now the bill to do so was actually the instance which uh, broke up the coalition that uh, Netanyahu had formed previously because the um, Orthodox religious party called Shas of, uh, of Mizrahim uh, Jewish Arabs who were supporting the Likud coalition withdrew their support because they couldn't support you know this bill which would have recruited their children and their daughters especially you know into the military which they could not tolerate so that's why his coalition fell apart before now if he continues with that policy then he will not be able to form a new coalition because his support for the Likud has declined it's expected he will only have 26 seats instead of 30 and that the Gantz Lapid uh, coalition will have 30 or 35 seats uh, but they don't have any uh, outstanding partners unless Shas chooses to join in with them but Lapid you know has um, forbidden that because he's uh, you know uh, uh, vowed you know to oppose the Orthodox and uh, wants to recruit them into the military which the Orthodox will not agree to so either Lapid has to give up that provision which is you know his main election plank basically what he calls you know sharing the burden of military service because the you know, Israelis are finally getting tired of doing military service so there seems to be a blockage there and then you know Gantz as well you know like uh, wouldn't be able to form a much of a coalition because he opposes forming a coalition with the Palestinian parties which would be gaining some seats there so how they're going to form a majority if they um, I know uh, cannot you know form a coalition with either the Shas religious party or the Palestinian political parties who knows anyway perhaps they can just function from bill to bill and you know lie upon you know the majority of votes you know on a circumstantial basis but uh, that's how it lines up to be now the news is we're still waiting for Gadir to be released from the prison and they seem to be delaying it you know because we have so many people here waiting for her and they seem to be aware of that because they just sent out the two guards there to uh, tell us to get lost and of course you know on such a mission they send out you know the two Ethiopian Jewish uh, guards to make it look good like they're not being racist that type of you know look good the racism in Israel of Zionism is not the standard racism that you would find in the United States you know based upon skin color or you know uh, origin but rather based upon national chauvinism national chauvinism is of course you know racism but a different form of racism and here the national chauvinism practiced by Zionism 
claims to be, you know, a national chauvinism based upon, you know, a Jewish nation. However, this is not true. Zionism is an ideology based upon Christian Protestant Restorationist uh, theology and uh, was not an original uh, Jewish proposition. The Jewish people, you know, since the Babylonian uh, exile and the Talmudic uh, So some good news, Donna Newman is recovering from being gravely ill. Yes, that is some good news. I hope everyone liked the interview I did with Steve Struggle, who was a member of the original Black Panther Party. At this point, it is, it's just simply best for Dr. Abram Weisfeld to speak for himself. We're looking to see if Gadir is walking out of the prison. There is a woman walking out down the highway there who's petite like Gadir. But, uh, Doesn't seem to be there, Gadir, no. More Palestinian workers coming back. No, that woman is going away in a car. She's been picked up. It's not Gadir. Okay, so the election tomorrow determines uh, the future uh, of Palestine for the coming period. Now, even though, you know, Netanyahu has uh, made an election promise to uh, annex, you know, the settlements and outposts of Sector C. Hello, Nasser. This is Nasser, another prisoner that I was uh, liberated with. We were in prison together all day, all night. So, this promise, electoral promise of Netanyahu, uh, is not immediately implementable. Even the uh, announced annexation of the Golan Heights was negotiated with the United States and planned for over a two-year period because, you know, these things are against international law and there's many uh, who would oppose, especially, you know, with the annexation of such a large sector of Palestine, 60% of the West Bank. This would enrage the, the Arab League, would be obliged to do something, otherwise they would suffer the consequences, namely, you know, social revolution in their own countries, which would get rid of those, you know, monarchies who are actually in alliance, you know, with Zionist Israel. So, in order to avoid the destabilization of the entire Middle East, uh, they uh, wouldn't be able to implement such an annexation policy immediately. Everything would depend upon the following year in which the United States of America is holding an election as well. And there Trump is running against and um, trying to get re-elected. Of course, if Trump is re-elected, then they could proceed with the annexation of Sector C of the West Bank here. But if Trump is not elected, and Bernie Sanders is elected the President of the United States of America, then Bernie Sanders has said that he opposes the occupation and this will not go through. And then, uh, you know, the recognition of Palestine will follow through, especially when Jeremy Corbyn is elected Prime Minister of England and on behalf of the Labour Party, and during which he has already promised that the first thing he would do when elected Prime Minister is to recognize the independent state of Palestine. So this whole Zionist trip would begin to be reversed. In fact, it has already begun to be reversed because Israel was forced to retreat from the Sinai Peninsula and the, uh, and the, uh, the, 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 the um, Suez Canal, which it was right up to, in a treaty with Egypt that it was desperate to achieve with Sadat, who was later assassinated. And, uh, for having made such a treaty, but Israel withdrew from the Sinai nonetheless and even removed a couple of settlements that were planted there in the Sinai Desert called the Yarmit, I think it was. 
The second retreat of the Zionist State of Israel was in Gaza when they had some 500 settlers there and they had to have 5,000 troops planted there in order to protect them. And uh, that became unfeasible and the General Sharon uh, withdrew them in order to cons consolidate the, uh, p the um, security and the power of the Zionist State. Of course, those settlers were merely removed from the Gaza and planted into the West Bank. But uh, nonetheless, Israel was forced to, to withdraw from the Gaza Strip. And since then, they've put it under siege, especially after 2006, when the more radical Hamas party actually won the Palestinian election, which was the first democratic election in the Arab world, and which was unrecognized by the rest of the world, except for Iran and Turkey and a few countries like that. Okay. So that was the second withdrawal of the Zionist state of Israel from territory, Gaza. And uh, the third withdrawal, partial withdrawal, minimalist withdrawal was the Oslo Agreement in 1993 when Israel actually signed an agreement, a peace treaty, with the Palestinian uh, PLO, Palestine Liberation Organization, to form an autonomous government called the Palestinian Authority in uh, the territory here, centered in Sector A, which is basically the cities and uh, some villages, in the villages uh, of Palestine, comprising two and a half million Palestinians. So the Palestinian Authority was set up and they set up, you know, like governmental headquarters. They had a national police, all that sort of apparatus. Until the second Intifada, yeah, the reason why the Oslo Agreement was signed by Israel is because, you know, in the first Intifada of 1987, you know, the Palestinians were fighting so fiercely against the um, military occupation that the military was actually suffering and they couldn't sustain such a prolonged internal guerrilla war. So they agreed the Palestinians PLO, Arafat, actually Arafat agreed to stop the resistance movement against the military occupation in exchange for the recognition of a partial autonomy in Sector A with provision for the recognition of the Palestine state over a five-year period of negotiations, except that Israel never followed through. So the Palestinian Authority remained and so because there was no follow-through, there was a second intifada that broke out when the General Sharon was elected Prime Minister of Israel, even though he was forbidden to hold higher office after he was considered responsible for, personally responsible for the massacre of Sabra Shatila in 1982 in Lebanon, in the Palestinian refugee camp, when 3,000 Palestinians were killed by the fascist allies of Israel, the Phalanges, over a three-day period. Now, that was the third withdrawal of Israel from Lebanon when they were first a partial withdrawal up to the Litani River from Beirut after that massacre and then a complete withdrawal from the Litani River to the uh, previous you know, border with Lebanon. Okay, then in uh, 1993, after, yeah, that was in 1985 and then there was the subsequent withdrawal under UN pressure. Then uh, Israel uh, uh, did not withdraw for the Golan Heights, you know, in Syria. That they still occupy and now they claim as to be annexed. But the Oslo Agreement in 1993 uh, was uh, uh, later uh, smashed by General Sharon when he came in to Nablus and Ramallah and bombed and uh, shelled, you know, with tank shells, you know, the uh, Mukata the Palestinian political headquarters and uh, destroyed, you know, pulverized, you know, the, uh, the governmental offices there. That's when Arafat was put under siege until finally he died under mysterious circumstances and probably assassinated by one way or another. S -s something to do with, you know, the water that he was forced to drink, probably. So, So Oslo uh, was smashed, but 
it was reborn and now the Meqatars are rebuilt and now there's a Palestinian Authority which is even going to the International Criminal Court against Israel. So Israel retreated and allowed this to happen and they could not reoccupy Sector A as General Sharon did in uh, 2001. The, what set off the uh, Second Intifada in 2001 was when General Sharon in a victory sort of, you know, march of his went into the Alaska Mosque compound plateau there with a thousand soldiers, yeah, to protect him, you know, one guy. And uh, this was such an outrage, you know, that the Palestinians revolted, you know, a military revolt and fought against, you know, the military occupation. Which is the right of any, you know, uh, occupied uh, people to do, uh, according to international law. So they then retreated, finally, and the uh, Palestinian Authority was re-established and began to acquire certain powers and international stature and international recognition, recognized as the Palestinian state by uh, so many countries uh, throughout the world. So that's where we are at. The Zionist strategy to advance and the Palestinian strategy to counter advance. Now we're still waiting for Gadir to come out of the prison. No word. Yes, I should ask, you know, if the uh, guards had anything to say about the release of Gadir. Did the uh, guards say anything about when Gadir is going to come out? No, they say, they say nothing. They just tell us to go away. Yeah, okay. No news yet for the release of Gadir. Here's this, her husband still waiting for her to return. Okay, resuming the uh, broadcast. I must have touched something. I don't know how long a broadcast, you know, Facebook will take. This is the longest uh, live broadcast I've ever made. I want to be sure that it's going to be saved. So I'm going to save this portion and then I will come back. it that was Dr. Abram Weisfeld uh, giving a very good and uh, well-rounded detailed history of the problems of Zionism as well as details about the final release of uh, a Palestinian comrade our heart goes out and our prayer and all of us who do pray for those of us who believe in, in God and pray we pray for Dr. Abram Weisfeld uh, to be remain intact now, as a Sephardi, a.k.a. a Jewish Al-Andalusian, I say to everyone, Palestina, libre, libre, ma'asalama, shalom, adio, al-quds, mi amor.